I uh, co-founded Elk Talk and the Healing Arts Programs, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Fox and our own Ken Culver, who is the Director of Research and Clinical Affairs for Elk Positive Inc., and uh, for giving up their Sunday nights to join us. I'm going to skip the polling questions because we have a lot to cover, and I do want to bring up um, our calendar, which I'm going to do right now for this week or this month, actually. And Dana, if Dana's here, which I don't know it, you can unmute and talk a little bit about our calendar. If not, I will give you guys the update. So um, Dana Carito is our, our one of our coordinators for the Healing Arts Program. What's special about the Healing Arts Program is it gives us an opportunity to uh, get to know other ELK uh, positive members and uh, have a, a, a way to connect with, with others. Uh, Monday, we have a death cafe at one o'clock. Uh, I know you guys are scared about that uh, saying of what the death cafe is, but it's a way for us to connect with each other and experience questions about um, our fate of our disease. And uh, we have chair yoga at 11 on Wednesday. I'll chat, which is, uh, we don't have an agenda. We just uh, open up mics and talk to each other. Guided imagery at three o'clock. And um, Thursday, it's a big day, art therapy at one. And our men's group is real important. Uh, we have a bunch of men that get together. And uh, typically, I'm one of the only men that come to these events. But in the men's group, we have a, a ton of men who come. Explore with Roy on Friday. And Mindset Reset with our own Heather Smith, who's a, a life coach. So you can find this calendar on outpositive.org and uh, find it under OutTalk. So... I'm going to stop sharing that, and uh, I'm going to pass the mic over to Summer Farman. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Sunday to join us this evening. Um, we have a special talk for you tonight on the hot topic of vaccines. Um, Ken Culver, our Director of um, Research and Clinical Affairs, is here to help um, us bring a special guest um, an old pal of his um, and world-renowned uh, vaccine expert to us um, to make sure that we are all informed um, with where the world is going with vaccines, specifically the alpha positive world. So thank you for joining us. Um, you can turn on your captions to help um, with any language barriers or if we're talking too fast or too slow, um, feel free to do that. And then again, um, this video recording um, with the help of Yvonne Diaz will be uploaded to YouTube within the next day or so. So uh, we also will make some slides available. So don't worry, um, Ken is here to translate for us. And also um, there will be some uh, materials you can get your hands on. So thanks so much. Al community, it's a pleasure to be with you for this exciting up, um, evening. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about cancer vaccines. And um, one of the reasons why we um, have chosen to do this a part of Alc Talk is we want to make sure everybody understands that cancer vaccines is not one thing and that it's really complex. And in many ways, it's still in its infancy, which I'll show you the reason I'm saying that. But we're all excited about it, and there's great promise. So what we are doing is we're going to have a series of presentations about cancer vaccines. And this is the first one. And uh, think Dr. Fox is coming, and we want it to be provocative. We want it to be thought-provoking. We want to set the stage, this bigger picture of what's involved in creating cancer vaccines and uh, the challenges, the possibilities, and the hope of it. Before we introduce uh, Dr. Fox starts his presentation, I wanted to uh, have a couple of slides. I wanted to just put some basic groundwork. On the left is how we think about EML4-ALK, right? And we think, all right, so EML4-ALK, when it's activated due to this fusion, it activates a whole bunch of other growth-promoting pathways, and people end up with lung cancer. 
And so when we give an inhibitor, we're inhibiting EL4 ALK, and it's stopping this downward activation of these growth-promoting pathways. On the right is a simplified view of what's happening with vaccines. And I think the first thing I want you to see is it's not as simple as the cartoon about EML4 ALK, where we're inhibiting a target and trying to stop the signaling of that target. Here, the, there are multiple steps that are required by our immune system to be able to create an immune response that will find and kill cancer cells. Any one of these steps along these circles, if it's not optimized, then the vaccine will have little or no therapeutic activity. So it's, it's a highly complex system. And so tonight we're going to talk about this bigger picture. And in subsequent meetings, we're going to focus in on different kinds of therapeutic vaccines and what their advantages and disadvantages are. I wanted you to know that by my calculation and in the literature I read and the references are at the bottom, there are four approved FDA vaccines for therapeutic cancer vaccines. There are preventative cancer vaccines, such as targeting HPV. But the first one and the last one, Tice and Adistarladrin, are for bladder cancer. And they're, they're, the BCG is the old tuberculosis vaccine you probably heard of. They infuse that uh, that into the bladder, and it helps induce an immune response to bladder cancer that's limited to the surface of the bladder. The one at the bottom is a virus instead of a bacteria that's used for early stage bladder cancer. And you can see the first one was approved in 1990. The next one in 2010, 20 years later, the next one five years later, and then the last one seven years later. So this isn't a fast moving field for FDA approval, like we've seen with targeted therapies. And the third one, which we for short, we call it TVAC, is another genetically engineered virus that um, is used for the treatment of the injection into metastatic, metastatic melanoma. Nothing for lung cancer here. And um, But I wanted to put this in a, a framework so we all understand where are we in the development of cancer vaccines. So if you look here in this lower left-hand corner, there are 360 trials, according to the paper I read from late last year, 360 trials for cancer therapeutic vaccines. Half of them are in phase one. The other half almost are in phase one, two, and phase two. So this is a field that's still maturing with very few of them in phase three trials. And one of the things we wanna do as out positive is to say, which of these are promising? Where can we invest our research dollars that'll move vaccines that could help outpatients from these earlier stages to these late stages? And our medical committees, your medical committees are working on that exact thing every week. Second of all, where are these vaccines being developed? And you can see the brain, blood, breast, about 10% of them are being developed in lungs. So that's about 36 clinical trials. So lung is not the dominant one for the current list that was provided here. Now, a third of them, they don't, they don't for sure know, probably because they're a phase one and they're, they're allowing multiple kinds of tumors. So lung cancer is a small, like many of the others, it's about 10% of that. And then finally, it's a very important point, and I know Dr. Fox mentioned it in our preparatory call, the vast majority of these vaccines are giving in combination. 75% of them are in combination with chemotherapy, cytokine, cell therapy, and so forth. So it's our intent as an ALK positive medical committee, as our groups, is that these vaccines at a minimum should be given with a TKI and potentially with one or two other immune stimulatory agents, which I'm sure Bernie is gonna to touch on as he goes forward. So I have one last slide, and I wanted to give you some key definitions because when it comes to Alctox in general, and certainly cancer vaccines, we have to put our thinking caps on. And so what is a cancer vaccine? It's a general term for an immunotherapy that trains 
your immune system to identify and destroy cancer cells. We all have that concept, right? Because probably almost everybody on the call went and got their COVID vaccine, has their tetanus vaccine, has their measles vaccine, and so forth. Those are given to train your immune system. So if one of those viruses comes along, the T cells and antibodies can respond and protect you or at least minimize the illness. So what are cancer vaccines made from? Well, there's a whole variety of sources. And tonight we're gonna to talk about some really novel things that Bernie's been working on, but they can be made from the patient's own tumor cells or immune cells. We're gonna hear some of that tonight. Or they can be made from proteins or other molecules that are found in or on cancer cells. And they each have their unique set of advantages and disadvantages, where it's how long it takes to make them, how generalizable are they to the whole lung cancer population? Uh, how do they need to be stored? How often do you have to give them? And the list goes on and on. And we're gonna delve into those points in the coming parts of our cancer vaccine series. So what's an antigen? When you talk about vaccines, you hear the word antigen over and over and over again. So what is it? It's any substance that induces immune, immune response against that substance. So you inject in um, protein, you inject in uh, proteins from the COVID virus, then it causes that the body, the immune system sees the what the antigens, the particles on the virus or you get a natural infection with COVID, your immune system sees the antigens on the cell surface, those proteins that cause an immune response. But what's really important to know is not all antigens induce a strong immune response. And so we think about, we think about now in L-positive lung cancer, if you look into the literature about 30% of ALK lung cancer patients spontaneously make antibodies against ALK. But those are not effective. And they can have in T cells that are responsive to ALK, but they're not effective because it's not that simple. Just having an antigen doesn't get you the whole way. And Bernie's going to talk about that. Neoantigens. You're going to hear tons about neoantigens. And those are... These are new proteins that form in or on cancer cells when mutations occur in the tumor. So the idea is that these new proteins are tumor specific because they're just being made within that tumor and therefore would be absent in normal tissues. So there's a lot of enthusiasm for neoantigens because the idea would be if you could train the immune system to fight against neoantigens, the immune response should be focused specifically on cancer cells. So there's a huge amount of work going on with neoantigens, but that's not the only way to approach vaccines, but that's a real, a big one. You're gonna hear the word immunogenicity over and over and over again. And that's a term we use Immunogenicity is the ability of an antigen to stimulate an immune response. So not all antigens, as I mentioned earlier, can in stimulate a strong immune response. So some antigens have low immunogenicity and some have high immunogenicity and a whole range in between. So obviously, if you're creating a vaccine, you want to have an immunogenic antigen so that the immune system is primed more likely to mount a vigorous response against whatever antigen you're injecting. Number six, dendritic cells. I didn't point out on the earlier slide that Provenge, which was the first vaccine approved for prostate cancer by the FDA, is a dendritic cell vaccine. Well, what in the world are dendritic cells? You and I rely on dendritic cells all the time, but we don't talk about them. They're a type of an immune cell that boosts immune responses. So what the dendritic cells do is they take up these antigens and then they show it to other parts of the immune system to magnify the immune response. 
So we call dendritic cells an antigen presenting cell. So for the immune system function, back in that complicated circle diagram I showed you, one of the key elements is the antigens that you give have to be presented to the immune system. They can't just float around in your blood. They have to be provided to the immune system by antigen presenting cells, dendritic cells is one of those. So you're gonna hear about that. And there are already dendritic cell uh, vaccines around the world. One of the patients in our out community is joining one in Switzerland. So we're gonna be learning more, but that's a definite dendritic cell is something you should be keeping in your mind. That's an important part of the whole, that the immune stimulatory aspect. Now, finally, the human genome, Every I hopefully, I have some of you are probably too young, but in 1989, the US and that global community kicked off the Human Genome Project. And at that time, we thought there were gonna be between 50 and 100,000 genes. Well, once the Genome Project finished about 10 years later, it turns out there's only about 20 genes that are actually making proteins that regulate the, bi the biology, our physiology that create us as humans and are functioning in our bodies today, only about 20,000. But what's amazing about that is that's only about 2% of our DNA. So a strand of DNA has about 3,000 base pairs in it, 3 billion rather, 3 billion base pairs. Only 1% of that is really different between those of us on the call. But that asks the question, well, why would our cells carry around 3 billion base pairs if we only need 2%? to be human. So in the beginning, because of the Human Genome Project, they initially said, well, this 20,000 genes that make proteins are the key, everything else is junk. But now we're learning that that 98% actually has critical roles in a whole variety of things in our body. And one of those key roles is being a part of cancer. And so one of the, this dark matter, this provocative title, this area called a dark matter, the, what creates the dark matter is in this 98%. So it's something that's new, it's something we're learning, but it's highly relevant to how we think about creating vaccines for cancer. And so it's with my great, great pleasure tonight to introduce Bernie Fox, who is a um, professor at Providence Hospital in Portland, Oregon. The two of us worked together at the National Institutes of Health uh, before we had gray hair. So not that long ago because of premature gray. Um, and he is extra extraordinarily qualified to give this kickoff lecture and hopefully expand our awareness and understanding about cancer vaccines that'll give us the basis on which our follow-up lectures will give a more specificity around all the different kinds. So Bernie is not gonna be talking specifically about an ALK lung cancer vaccine, but I'm sure as he goes through it, you'll be able to see how the kinds of things he's working on could be directly relevant to what we're aiming to create for our, our patient community. So without further ado, Bernie, welcome. Thank you for joining. And we look forward to being challenged about dark matter. Okay, if you got my, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Mm, let me get my pointer turned on again. It looks great, Bernie. Okay, it looks good? Yep. Okay, so let me see if I can get um, uh, more. Okay. Okay, so um, one, Ken, thanks for the introduction. And, uh, and Summer, thanks for uh, going through kind of background with me prior to this, uh, this, this meeting. Um, and uh, to all of you on this uh, this Zoom call or the Zoom talk, uh, I'm really it's really delighting. Uh, let me say it okay to there. Delighted for me to uh, to be able to do that. Um, 
As Ken mentioned, um, I'm actually have an endowed chair. I'm the Harder Family Chair for Cancer Research. And I'm member in chief at the Laboratory of Molecular and Tumor Immunology at the Early Childs Research Institute, which is part of the Providence um, Health System, which is the third largest not-for-profit health system in the U.S., 52 hospitals from Alaska to West Texas, down through the West Coast, and uh, 52 hospitals and 47,000 new cancer patients a year, including a large number of lung cancer patients. I'm also the founder and CEO of UBVAC, which is a biotech company that has been making uh, cancer vaccines uh, for, for lung cancer, breast cancer, head and neck cancer, and others. And I'm also on the graduate faculty for the last 30 years at Oregon Health Science University and a member of the Knight um, Cancer Institute, uh, an NCI-designated cancer center. I'm showing you here images. This is this area here, if you can see my pointer, is cancer. The little yellow spots are the cancer killer cells. You can see in this patient's biopsy, there's no cancer killer cells in their tumor. This is now eight weeks after treatment. And you can see lots of these yellow cells coming in. They're all interacting with the tumor and the tumor is regressing. That's part of what, what you're seeing. So before I go too much further, I just, as part of my conflict of interest management, I just want to acknowledge that I have a number of potential conflicts of interest. Um, that I, When I talk today, I will talk about a clinical trial that's being done with Insight is funding and supporting that trial. And it's the vaccine that's being made by UBVAC, of which I'm the co-founder and CEO of that company. Um, and I will, and they've also provided support. So what excites me about this is I know that immunotherapy can cure patients of their cancer. This is a picture, this is now a 10 year old, this is from January of 2014, a, a report at the NIH record where Dr. Stephen Rosenberg, which is whose lab I trained in starting now 40 years ago, um, we treated this woman, um, uh, Linda Taylor, who was treated back when I was a fellow in the surgery branch. And what was exciting is that she had wildly metastatic melanoma throughout her body and had a very likely short time to live. And at those days, people were not being cured of melanoma. Their lifespan was, was measured in months. But patients who had a complete response we're still alive, not at 20 months, but at 20 years. And Linda Taylor and Steve Rosenberg received the AACR Lifetime Achievement Award. That's the American Association for Cancer Research, the, the world's largest cancer research organization. And he received the Cancer um, Lifetime Achievement Award last Sunday. And he talked about Linda Taylor again, who's now out 39 years from her, from her cancer. So what's really great is that patients, some patients have had amazing responses and are apparently cured. But what's striking is that today, we still do not know why these treated patients were cured. Uh, we still don't know the mechanism of action or MOA of responses to many cancer immunotherapies. And even when people will tell you they know what the mechanism is, we don't really know the mechanism of what's actually ultimately destroying all the cancer cells. So one of the challenges is that cancer evolves. Cancer is changing a lot. And in this story. It's an old story from science by Bert Vogelstein, who's a, a rock star genomics person at, at Johns Hopkins. You think of cancer as being founded by a single cell, single cell that's maybe got a mutation in it that starts it to be, become a cancer. But as it grows, that cancer changes, it evolves. And so different clones look different. They express different genes. And when that tumor is growing in your body or in the patient's body, those different colonies can go to different sites. And this is showing a, a, a tumor metastasizing to the liver. And here the orange clone is going over here and here the blue clone is going over there. And, but with time, that orange clone and that blue clone, they continue to evolve. And this is never more striking than if you, if you see an autopsy on a patient with metastatic melanoma, they've had melanoma for a long, for a long time. What is striking is that you can find tumor nodules that are black, some that are brown, some that are gray, some that are white. That just speaks to the amazing heterogeneity that cancer can evolve to express. And so it, it's the daunting part that if you pick any, any single mutation that's only in the purple cells, it may kill all the purple cells, but not kill any of these other ones. In the case of the elk mutation, hopefully the elk mutation is present in every cell because the cell needs that to become cancerous. But the problem is when you only have one element, what can happen is that the immune system will target that and the tumor cell will turn off putting the elk 
mutation on the surface of the cancer and the cancer can then grow. So based on these diagrams here, the hypothesis the hypotheses that we have are if you want to eliminate the entire tumor, it requires a diversity of antigen specific T cells or these cancer killer cells, cancer killer cells that can see, you know, not just five or six or 10 or 20, but a large number of, of antigens. And I'll, I'll give you some evidence at the end of this talk of patients with lung cancer, at least a given patient with, with lung cancer, who's long-term survivor, developed lots and lots of T cell responses against lots of different targets, at least humoral targets. You also need antibody responses because even if antibody responses don't directly kill the tumor, they help the immune system. They help those dendritic cells further amplify the, the T cell immune response. And then the other part of this is that it's not just your T cells and your B cells, your cancer killer cells and your helper cells and your B cells. There's other what we call innate effectors. These are things like natural killer cells, a great name, right? But they can kill lots of different tumors and other cells in our body, macrophages and things that can play a role in destroying cancer. So thinking about this, how can we effectively activate immunity to kill cancer? And I've taken this picture from a review in Nature Reviews Immunology, and it's a different way to look at the heterogeneity of cancer. So instead of them being different colors, there's only a yellow triangle or an orange circle or a blue circle, but those are different cancer cells with different mutations, different antigens being expressed on their surface. So if you give a vaccine against all those components, the idea is now you've developed orange killer cells that can hopefully kill these orange guys and, and blue killer cells that can kill these guys and yellow ones that can kill these guys. That's the idea. You wanna turn on broad immunity to lots of different targets. So there have been recent successes with, with neoantigens. I hope you can see the whole screen and you're not, this part is still hiding here. I'm trying to get it. Um, no, okay, I can't get that to go up. Okay, but- I tell you, these the guys reason. that are really brilliant so, like this. We I'm see sorry? the top this of your slide, doctors. Bernie. We see the top of your slide. You see the top? Yeah, no problem. Okay. Okay, so the, the recent successes with these neoantigen cancer vaccines, this is a little bit what Ken talked about. And to do this, you need to take the patient's own tumor and their normal cells, typically. You then have to look at the DNA to see where is the mutation in those and look at the RNA to make sure they're being made. You then type those patients, and then you predict which of those mutations might be able to show up on the surface of the cancer cell. And those are predictions, and we don't know that they're not very good predictions for many. But then once we know that, then now we synthesize the mRNA for these new vaccine strategies, just like the COVID vaccine. And then you've got these, these are the neoantigens. They're called different things. And you put those into a vaccine. So what's been shown so far is that it's safe and it's feasible to do this. It takes six to eight weeks, but it's been able to be done now at in a, in, a, in a high percentage of the patients. It appears that it's at least some of these are highly immunogenic in some patients. Many of the neoantigens, the supposed neoantigens are not immunogenic as Ken was alluding to, or they're not, you don't get strong immunity. But there's been promising combinations with anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1. Those are the checkpoint blockers. You probably all know about it. It's the, what you see on television, a chance to live longer. There's lots of commercials. But the two studies that were really um, caught a lot of press were one that Jeff Weber presented a year ago uh, this month at AACR in 2023, which was in patients at high risk of melanoma. So they had had their melanoma cut out, but it was a high risk melanoma to come back. The Wall Street Journal talked about that. The following month in May of last year, May 10th, um, there was a paper in the New England, in, in Nature actually, which looked at a pancreatic cancer vaccine doing the same thing. People that were at high risk of their cancer coming back. And in fact, about half those patients um, were still disease free at the time that they came out. So the melanoma study was not quite as solid as that, but it was both of them showed promise. And they're now um, a phase three trial is either about to start or is already underway there. And additional studies are undergoing ongoing with pancreatic cancer. 
The problem is for the neoantigen vaccines is that many tumors have low numbers of neoantigens. And this is looking at 62,000 cancers and only about 4,328 had high TMB. That means high tumor mutational burden. And another 700 of those were what they call MSI high. That's like a, a microsatellite instability that just generates lots and lots and lots of mutations because the patient's cancer can't doesn't get repaired at all. So it just gets more and more mutations. So the source of the antigens for these patients are going to be the best ones would be driver mutations like elk. That would be a mutation you'd want to use if if your if your immune system could could see it. These other ones are passenger mutations. Those are things the tumor doesn't need, but they're mutations that it has. And so if it doesn't need the mutation to grow, making an immune response against that may not uh, ultimately be as helpful because you might only eliminate a subset of the, of the cells that have got it. But there are other cancer antigens we can target. And those are things called tumor-associated antigens. And I'll talk about those in a second. And viral antigens. And, and Ken mentioned this for HPV. And, and hopefully... You've got kids or grandkids, hopefully they're all getting the HPV vaccine um, because that really can prevent um, oral cancers that are HPV positive, uh, penile, rectal cancers. Um, and so there's a lot of, of good for that. But the other part that we're gonna talk about is dark matter. And dark matter is a recently discovered component that appears to have a, a number of benefits um, that we'll talk about. So first, these guys, the tumor-associated antigens. The NCI now, more than a decade ago, reported a prioritized about 70 um, antigens for clinical trial development. And five of those were neoantigens. The rest of the 70 were, were tumor-associated antigens and viral peptides. So that's a large number of these are the antigens to look at. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those too. But in my opinion, the biggest immunotherapy discovery of the last year, last three years, is cancerous dark matter. So this over here is a cancer cell. It's only a quarter of a cancer cell because the other part's off the screen. But on the surface of the cancer cell are these molecules. These little things are called HLA or your tissue antigens. It's what you have to match if you have a kidney transplant or a heart-lung transplant. But these little molecules, what they do is they're sampling what the proteins are inside your cell, and they're putting the proteins, little peptides of them, small amino acid sequences, about nine to 11 amino acids, holding it out like a set of hands so that your T cells can recognize that there's something funny going on inside the cell. And that's how viral infected cells are seen. But what we didn't know is there was dark matter there too. And these are immune targets on the cancer cell surface that are hidden in the dark from the immune system. And I'll describe a little bit about what that, how that happens or how, what we, how we understand it happening today. And some dark matter appear to provide cancer its malignant properties, similar to driver mutations. So just like ELK creates, as Ken was showing in that diagram, and you're probably all aware, how it turns on genes to cause cells to divide and metastasize, that's what dark matter, at least some dark matter is doing as well. It's able to turn on um, rapid proliferation. It's able to turn on the properties that cells need to be able to metastasize. And so, and there, there are so, in some cases, these are being identified as, as molecules that are similar to driver mutations, but are really associated with bad outcomes in patients with cancer that have that dark matter. So what does dark matter mean? For the immunotherapy space? Well, well, first, it's there's potential for universal cancer vaccines, and I'll give you a reference for why, why people have said that. It's also the discovery of novel targets, new things that we did not know about at all um, that are present there. And the interesting thing, I think, for me is that it's not just about cancer. This is probably related back to everything from rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune diseases to Crohn's and, and other things are all probably associated with this because it's dysregulation and, and, and things that cause disease. And again, this is just now being discovered. It's in the last three years. So this is something that, that I used AI to generate. And, and what this is, this is supposed to be the cancer cell here. And I asked AI to show me, put 10% of the surface of the cell 
with dark matter, with what it called dark matter. And this is what what we're guessing. The reason we're calling it dark matter is they're targets we didn't know about on cancer because they're coming from things that we previously thought were never being expressed and made into protein. But now, because of because you need all these other technologies to be able to identify it, specifically mass spectroscopy, and then you've got to have really um, intensive bioinformatics and, and all these other things you have to have, it wasn't discovered. So this is really new stuff. And it's a rapidly evolving area. In some cases, it's derived from the other 98% of the genome, what, what, what Ken was talking about, about the so-called junk DNA. But there's other parts that are coming from part of the genome that was thought to be regulatory, but was thought to never make protein. And I know that's a deeper dive than we need to get into, but most of it appears to be not mutated. Again, it's, there's not, they're not neoantigens in the sense that there's a mutation there. Some appear to be shared by cancers, and I'll present a little bit of data um, to talk about that or give you some references to that. Some are associated with bad outcomes. This is the part I've talked about. You can almost think of them as potentially being like driver mutations, but they're not mutated. They're driver elements that are coming from this dark matter. And that's what's causing, appears to be causing the cells to proliferate rapidly and cause their metastatic potential, which is why they're really important. And so coming back again to my conflict that UBVAC had made a vaccine, which it turns out we didn't know at the time we were doing it to make other things concentrate them. It turns out it was also concentrating what is now being called cancer's dark matter. So I've been working in lung cancer and tumor vaccines for a while. And I just wanted to give you one example of a trial we did um, a number of years ago, um, actually about 25 years ago, um, started at 25 years ago. But we take the patient's tumor out. We isolate the cells and genetically engineer them with a cytokine called GMCSF or granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, which is activates those dendritic cells that Ken was talking about and, and can further make them better antigen presenting cells to better stimulate or educate the T cells and the B cells to see cancer. So then you radiate that after you genetically engineer them and inject them back in. And I'll show you this, this was published in the JNCI back in 2004. So a little more than 20 years ago. Um, and this was a gentleman's arm. This was his vaccine site in his arm. And this was his immune reaction to about his fourth vaccine. Now, the people thought that we had an infection, but he didn't have an infection. That huge response was there. And when we took a few of his irradiated tumor cells and injected them in his skin, and these are my, that's my thumb, so they can't really read this, but this was his thigh. It turned deep red here and was white red. I don't know if you can appreciate that all around. He made a rip-roaring immune response. Now, was this a young guy? No. This was 82-year-old 82 82-year-old 82 ex-Marine from the Philippines. Tony Benfit, where he had this immune response, and we're still studying him now and his blood, because I've got blood in him. We're trying to understand what was the magic, what I cited as the magic in his blood that led him to have a response. And there were three of these 33 patients that had complete and durable uh, responses. So I want to also state that I'm not against neoantigens. I don't want my talk to seem like that. And I'm, I'm just showing this because I, I collaborate with my, my colleague, Eric, Eric Tran, who's a, a brilliant adoptive immunotherapist who's been um, working on adoptive transfer to neoantigen-specific T cells, and my colleague, Ron Widener. Um, but but I, I do support this, and I think it's really important because you can see this neoantigen-reactive T cells can make this, this, this actually pancreatic cancer metastasis to the lung go down here, and this one to shrink here. So I, I do believe in neoantigens too. But we can't just exclude everything else um, just to focus on neoantigens because that's, it's, it's much more limited in terms of the neoantigens. So I can't really see the top of my slide because of this. But the, the whole idea is that the key to discovering um, these targets, we're going to have to look in the dark. Um, and, and this is the cartoon, the whole idea that the, a person who loses his keys at night looks for them under the streetlight even though he may not have lost them there. And, and the idea here is that we've been looking for, at neoantigen reactivities and, and, and the ability of the immune system to see these neoantigens, these mutations, because 
you only have so much blood from a patient and it takes a lot of blood to do every single assay. And so if we can focus just on somebody, if they've got 20 or 50 mutations, we can focus on just the immune response to those few mutations. But when you think about the, the 20,000 proteins and things that can get upregulated and expressed and all their modifications, it's impossible to do it unless you have a, some other strategy to look at it. So this is the key, you know, trying to find that that whatever it is that may not be the mutation specific response in patients. So I'm working on a review to put this together to summarize this. But what I'm, what I'm thinking about is this, in the early days, all the immunity that we were studying in patients was against tumor associated antigens. There was very little that was mutation specific. Recently, it's been a huge shift the last, the last decade to be only focusing on neoantigens and think about the elk mutant and, and viral antigens. There's been very little over here under the tumor associated antigens. But I think the data and some of the data that I'll show you in, in a minute here will say that this is really important and that the responses to these other antigens, we need to be studying it better. And it's not just myself that's doing this, but a number of other groups around the country are, are working on this. I'm not expecting you to understand this paper, but I had to put it in because it is the basis for what we understand. I'm looking at my time, I got a little bit faster, but the whole point here is that they looked at all the, all the things that were on the surface of this acute myeloid leukemia. They found that there were, there were lots of these tumor antigens and about 85% was developed, was derived from this dark matter. And it was high patient sharing and they could induce an immune response. So that's a really oversimplified version of that but, but that's, that's really what that was showing. And that really, that turned the world upside down for me because it said that there's all this stuff that we didn't know anything about. And I had already had a collaboration with a group for the last three years looking at this. And so we started to look more at this. But one of the reviews, this is from uh, Dr. Catherine Wu, who's a professor at the Dana-Farber in Boston and part of the Broad Institute, very smart uh, individual. She wrote this commentary on that paper I just showed you that this now has the potential for universal off-the-shelf immunotherapies. So if you think about the neoantigen vaccines, they're patient-specific, at least many of those. Maybe the elk mutation may be off the shelf. But these other ones are taking six to eight weeks to make, and so it takes time. And I'll just say this was, I was at the Stand Up to Cancer retreat. There's other ones that have been finding these in pancreatic cancer. There were papers earlier this year identifying more. So it's not just it's not just a few people identifying it. This group's in China, this group's in Switzerland. And then I was on a panel for the Parker Institute. Sean Parker created the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy. And they set the title as the session as Cancer Vaccination Success at Last. But I would say, except for me, the rest of these people are really kind of world experts in cancer vaccines. And what was um, the, the point of the panel was set up to talk about its neoantigens, right? But everybody's agreed here. Kathy Wu is the person I was just talking about, about universal cancer vaccines. Nina Bardwaj is Mount Sinai, New York, Ray Fong, UCSF, and now at UW, and then Hong, Han Chong To, who's at, at Singapore. They all agreed that there's other antigens, shared antigens, that are likely very important in developing immune responses to cancer. Um, I think we're one of the first ones to characterize this as cancer dark matter. This was a commentary that we talked about last year. But what's important and in this cartoon, what I'm trying to get across is that there's, there's different types of proteins and they come in two different classes in a cell. Some proteins, the cell makes it and they're long lived. They can be structural proteins. They can create the, the, the cell and be important for other functions. But there's other proteins that are made that are called short lived proteins or DRIPS or dark matter. These proteins are made, but then they're degraded really quickly. And so they get stabilized on those hands I was talking about on the surface of the cell, little peptides of the dark matter are there. But that's not how the dendritic cell works. The dendritic cell doesn't pick up those little peptides. What it does is it picks up the whole protein. So when the cell tumor cell dies, the vast majority of what it's releasing are these red long lived proteins. So the dendritic cell takes it, processes it, and then activates and educates the, the T cells that can see the red antigen shown here in red. So they can see the little bit of the red peptide there. But this yellow T cell over here, it doesn't ever get activated to turn on so it can see the yellow peptide. So you have to 
And so this explains a lot of things. It explains why we never found them. Because we were using the, the cells that were being activated from the till, the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, to screen for antigens. And so that's what was very different. And then we need, what we, we figured out is we need to prime in vitro in a test tube, right? You have to take and, and show these yellow peptides to the dendritic cell and then try and expand the cells or make a vaccine that's got those yellow proteins, hopefully before they're degraded and put that and vaccinate with that. So that's what we do. And so this is the technology developed from, from UBVAC, but essentially we take cancer cell lines. These cancers on the surface have got these little hands on them that are showing the peptides, the blue, the yellow, the green, the orange. That's what the T cells can see, but that's not what the dendritic cell needs to pick up. The dendritic cell needs to pick up these whole proteins. The problem is, is that they're degraded so fast that the dendritic cell never gets a chance to see them. So what we do is we block this process, this degradation process, this shunts these guys, these, these dark matter and short-lived proteins into this other pathway. And we can collect these now as whole proteins and use that as a vaccine. This is what the vaccine looks like by EM as a cartoon. It's a small micro vesicle. It's got lots of antigens in it. But what it's got, it's on its surface. It's targeted to the dendritic cells. It's got molecules that will bind to the surface of the dendritic cell. It's then got immune stimulants that once it's inside the dendritic cell, it activates it. It makes it, it can now make IL-12. It has other markers on its surface that it's upregulated. So this is the first vaccine that's got dark matter. It's got lots of other antigens besides the dark matter. And it's got, um, it induces both helper and CD8 killer cell responses. So the CD4 and the CD8 cells, it's important to get both of them based on animal studies, but many of the other vaccines only induce CD8 responses. And so that's kind of a limitation. So we've run a trial of this vaccine in patients with lung cancer. And this was in patients that were at high risk of their cancer coming back. So they're definitively treated stage 3A or 3B non-small cell lung cancer. We gave them this vaccine again, which is this DOR, DB, DPV001, which has got five of these TOR or immune stimulants in these dams with the antigens and dark matter. We inject it into the skin. And what happens, well, actually in the first one, we go internodally, but, but what happens is that the vaccine gets picked up by these DCs, it activates the CD4s, the CD8s, and the B cells, and then we can study that. So this was a study that was an NCI funded uh, study. UBVAC was the sponsor. We've characterized how many proteins, how many normal proteins are in the vaccine for genes that are overexpressed in cancer. They've got more than 300 for the average patient. We know that everybody made an immune response once they got injected. And I show this for safety, um, but the total population got the vaccine plus standard chemo radiation therapy. The idea was that it's safe, that you can give this and it looks like they're surviving at least as well as the controls were back in the early days. And that people that got uh, PD-1 didn't do worse and we still got patients alive um, at eight and nine years. So the point is that this is safe to give this, this vaccine with dark matter to patients with lung cancer. We also know that of the patients that have been vaccinated, it, that the vaccine induces immune responses to lung cancer antigens that are contained in the vaccine and that are associated with worse survival. And that's the data down here. And it's been presented at, at CITSI, but not been published yet. And this data shows that cancer genome atlas from the sequencing of all these cancers shows that many of the antigens in our vaccine are shared across solid cancers, including head and neck, breast, ovary, stomach, prostate, and brain. The reason I've highlighted head and neck is because we, we were looking for grants to fund the lung cancer study, but we did get support to do another study in head and neck. Since the vaccine could work for all these cancers, we then went to head and neck. And I'll talk to you about this data, which is now where we've been drilling down on the dark matter. So this has been led by Dr. Ram Widener with help from Dr. Marcus Kui. And this is a study that's been supported by Insight. Um, but essentially patients get a biopsy of their tumor before treatment at week two and week eight. They get a vaccine and then they get vaccine and then they get vaccine and then they get PD-1. And there's more vaccines here and more PD-1. Or they get vaccine in this other antibody, which is which is a T cell agonist antibody anti-gitter, vaccine, PD-1 and gitter, and continuing on up for two years. 
the point of this is is that if I can just go to this other analogy, and I took that slide out, well, it, it's like the vaccine is is that many patients, some patients, PD one, which is a, a checkpoint blocker, people take it, uh, make make the similarity to it. it's like taking the brakes off the immune system. So the problem is is that many people's immune system isn't even turned on yet. So if you we'll use the, the take the take your foot off the brake analogy. If your car is sitting in the garage and hasn't even got started yet, if you take your foot off the brake, it's not going to change anything for that garage to what's happening where the car is going. If you give a gas pedal drug and a checkpoint blocker, take the foot off your brake, but the car isn't turned on, it's still not going to go anywhere and you're probably going to flood the engine. So the idea of the vaccine, the vaccine turns the immune system on, steers it towards the cancer. In this case, we were then giving it, giving it more gas and then taking the foot off the brake or turning it on, steering it towards the cancer and taking off the brake. Those are the two things we were trying to do. These data were just presented less, less than a week ago, um, uh, last Monday, April 8th. Um, and we were very excited about this because we've shown that we're doubling to greater than threefold increases in response rates in patients that were PD-1 naive, where the label is typically 16% uh, to 21%, 22% response rates versus a six-fold increase in people who have had, had PD-1 and didn't respond. There, the response rate is less than 5%, and we were seeing response rates of 33%. So I'll show you this. Ken said you'd, you'd show a waterfall plot. Um, again, this is 18 patients. There were two patients that progressed before uh, they got evaluated. But you can see that we're, we've got um, a, a fairly good response rate overall, 55% um, again in the PD-1 naive and 33% on the PD-1 experience. And I'll show you just these scans. These are only from the poster. I'm not showing anything that we haven't presented. Um, but that this is happening in patients. If I show you patient GDP-01, this patient had a large mass here that regressed. And now the patient's out two years. She's got um, a, an inguinal node there that's that got tumor in it by PET scan. And this nodule has never completely re re resolved or has come back. This patient has got a CPS score of five. That means that they've got a, a very low chance of responding to PD-1 alone. So we think this is a result of the combination of the therapy. This patient has a CPS score of zero, which means they've got no uh, pd one positive cells. They should not respond to PD-1 alone. But here, and it's an HPV positive cancer, this patient's responding. Here's a couple other patients that have responded with low CPS scores. Um, and here's patients that are responding with high CPS scores. Here's a patient now with multiple nodules um, going away. So what we're finding is that with this vaccine, again, we've, we've doubled to tripled the response rates. We've got still six patients um, that are on trial receiving treatment th that have uh, not progressed. And we're very excited about that. I want to drill back down a little bit on dark matter. This was a dark matter poster presented in November. We haven't published these data, but I'm presenting it to you now. This is looking at the lung cancer patients that we've looked at. So one of the patients who's now alive at nine plus years, we developed a lung tumor cell line from his tumor. We know that, you know, we talked about how many antigens he got vaccinated with. He got vaccinated with lots of antigens. And it turned out he has 813 peptides on the surface of his cancer cells for proteins that were in the vaccine we gave him. And we imagine he's made at least 58 immune responses to those. And we know about 8% of that appears to be potentially dark matter for non canonical peptides. So we've got a lot more to do, uh, but I'm trying to present to you data that we've actually presented in meetings, um, but it's not been published as well as published data. And so what I see the universal problem with cancer is that cancer antigens are targets for the immune system to recognize, and often these targets are hidden. And the problem with the cancer vaccines is that typically we've utilized only well-known immune targets our less known or these hidden targets have not been explored. And as Ken pointed out, combinations, they need to be done in combination. We cannot expect cancer vaccines to cure patients by themselves. So combining with TK inhibitors and at a minimum, a checkpoint blocker is kind of going to be the future. And we're trying to do that in lung cancer ourselves. Uh, I've told Ken I'm working on a grant uh, still today that's got to go in tomorrow for breast cancer. And we're trying to, again, look for support for lung cancer as well. So summary, cancer's dark matter is rapidly evolving area. Some of these are expressed only by cancer, not the thymus. 
Uh, I realize I've gone along. Some appear to be shared by cancers. They've got bad outcomes. Those are going to be the really important ones. And we're trying to discover what those are. They're recently discovered. We've got an off-the-shelf vaccine that's enriched for this dark matter. And we're trying to, to do that. I've, I've got lots of people that are part of this team with me. Um, I, I do almost nothing. It's all done by them. I got a really sight that Insight has been amazing in supporting the research. We had another trial at BMS um, that I didn't get a chance to talk about. But the people at, at UBVAC, the people, Hung Ming Hu, my colleague who developed the technology, um, Walter Erba, Brendan Curdy, Rachel Sanborn, uh, David Page, Ron Widener, Brian Bell, Marcus Kui, all these people have been critical to the translation of this into patients and some of the dark matter stuff that I alluded to. And I'll stop there. Bernie, Sorry for going so long. No, Bernie, I took up too much of your time and in my introduction. No. Um, that was awesome. And um, I'm just going to... Um, mention a few things, Bernie, and then to address a couple questions to you. So um, one of the questions is uh, about the neoantigen vaccines. And Suzanne, you are right. The predictions come from bioinformatics and um, they're predictions only. So we're, we're learning uh, by from patients as we go. So uh, Bernie, the FDA approval process, I know you've been to the FDA many times to get your trials approved. Is the process for getting a vaccine approved different from targeted therapies or checkpoint inhibitors? It is actually, it's it's a bit easier because it's it's under CBER, uh, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. And so the, and many of these are done at academic centers or on the cusp. So the FDA is, has tended to, to what people do procedures that aren't full GMP, which is what costs, you know, $25 million or more, right, to make a drug so that academic centers can do it for much less. Um, we were able to do our lung cancer trial with everything with NCI funding at about $4 million. So we were able to do a, a great deal, making all the vaccine, making the GMP master cell banks, making the working cell banks, making the vaccine and running the trial. Um, so those are the kind of things that the FDA does. The other trials, it's got to be full GMP, which which costs lots of money up front. Mm -hmm. And so GMP is uh, good manufacturing procedures, which is the is a really expensive part to make sure manufacturing quality is maintained throughout the process. Uh, so Deborah, uh, off the shelf, off the shelf means you can give it to anybody. You don't have to make a specific vaccine for each individual person. So lorlatinib, um, it, uh, yeah, lorlatinib, lectinib, all those are off-the-shelf drugs. But if we had to make a drug specifically for a specific ALK uh, mutant protein, then that would, would not be off-the-shelf. That would be personalized therapy. Um, also, this Bernie, Summer told you they would ask you, does your vaccine penetrate the CNS? Yeah, so so um, the vaccine doesn't, but the immune cells we think do. So that patient I showed you, UBLTO2, the gentleman is still out at nine years, he had a metastasis to his brain. When we looked in his brain, he had all these T cells that were in his brain um, in the tumor, and, and they were killer cells because we could grow them out and show that they killed his tumor. Uh, but every tumor cell held, had PDL1 on it. So um, we, we believe from the data that we have that we've augmented and expanded those T cells in that patient from what he had before treatment. So we think that the vaccine induced the T cells and the T cells can go to the brain. In fact, um, my, my uh, mentor, Steve Rosenberg, has shown that extensively in patients with melanoma and other cancers, that if you turn on T cells, they will, will go anywhere the cancer is and cause the tumor and can cause tumor regression. It doesn't always work, but they can do that. Thank you, Bernie. Also addressing the question um, about the role of pharma. So the of the four vaccines, I didn't look at who manufactures all of them, but the BCG vaccines made by Merck. One of the other ones is made by Amgen. So big pharma are involved in vaccines. But remember, I showed you most of them are in phase one. So most of the pharma are waiting to see what's going to emerge yeah. out of these early stage trials that are worthy of multi-billion dollar investments. So um, that would be one thing. Uh, ALK on the cell surface. So we know that, so ALK 
in lung cancer where it's a fusion, only those peptides are on the cell surface from ALK that are held by the hands. And that is the vaccine by Kiarly and Awad that we've been supporting at Dana-Farber is specifically targeting those peptides. That means it's HLA, HLA restricted and it can't be off the shelf for everybody. It could be off the shelf only for specific ge genetic types. Whereas um, in neuroblastoma, where it's a mutant ALK, now you have the mutant ALK on the cell surface, and now you have more options to develop vaccines against the cell surface. So it's different in ALK lung cancer than in other ALK, ALK positive diseases. <laughs> uh, Summer and Mark, what else should we be asking that I should have pulled out of the chat? Or you? what questions do you have? You know, the, I saw the one about when is the best time um, to have a vaccine, and if you are NED, you don't have any evidence of disease, are you still? Um, I know there are a couple different vaccines out there. Some require no progression. Some you need to be progressive. <clears throat> I don't know if either of you have thoughts on that, please. So so, so my thoughts is yes, <laughs> all of the above, right? So so I, I think where the field is going is, right, You want, as you identify people at high risk, uh, we're, we're already we've been looking at that. We reported on that at uh, at Sitsi two years ago at Boston on on preventative vaccines. Something we worked on with Janssen, Johnson and Johnson uh, for oral cancer. I think that's just an example of somebody who's at high risk of oral dysplasia moving on to cancer. Um, but but also in the in the neoadjuvant setting, um, all those big pharma. I've been talking to all of them to try and let us combine give us their PD-1s, give us their other agents to combine in patients prior to surgery, um, both in lung. And, and that's where we're currently working with another group to get resources so we could do a study in non-small cell lung cancer is combination neoadjuvant therapy with potentially chemotherapy, PD-1 blockade, and a vaccine. Um, and we think the nice thing about that is we can give it again off the shelf. It's got more than 300 proteins plus dark matter for the patients. And so they could get it immediately, right? When they're first diagnosed, once they sign a consent form, they could go on to a, a trial. Then the adjuvant setting, which is the other trial that I reported to you on, where we, we gave our trial in the adjuvant setting because I, I didn't believe it that, even though I showed you Mr. Benefit's picture and he only got vaccine alone, I think in general, vaccines have failed when given alone. And I, I wanted to give them to patients who I thought we wouldn't take away any other options for them. So these are people who had gotten full treatment, right? They're, they're, they're definitively treated. They're at high risk of recurrence, but they're not going to get any other therapy. So we could go into those patients to get mechanisms of action. I think that's the other place where we can go. And I think the fact, I, I can't, those survival curves are not to show you or not to think suggest that the vaccine changed the survival. I mean, it, it's encouraging, but we don't, it wasn't power to do that. It's just to show that it's safe, that those people didn't develop a third arm or a second head or something else, that that they, they're, they're live, alive and living, okay, with be, not be, you know, having received the vaccine. So when I think that in therapy advanced settings, we're looking at, at lung till. So you look at patients who get till. The problem is with till, the, the, the IOVANS product, they can have rapid responses until in, in there's reasonable response rate, but they're of short duration. And so just like you take a vaccine for COVID, right? You need to be boosting those T cells. The cancer is there. So you, some people would think, oh, the cancer is going to keep stimulating the T cells. No. The problem is those cancers make all kinds of things that turn off the immune system. And the tumor environment is a lousy place to prime immunity. You want to be looking in the periphery where there's not cancer, which is why you give a vaccine someplace where there's not cancer to try and boost the immune responses. That's what we think. And there is some data to suggest that vaccines with adoptive immunotherapy could help. The thing with TIL is that TIL recognize a large number of antigens, and we don't know what they all are. Our vaccine is great for that because we've got all these antigens from, from one cancer and other cancers that are in the vaccine. So that's kind of the whole playing field of where I think, at least most of it, where the vaccines can be used. Uh, a couple of questions that just popped in. Uh, would you need boosters like the COVID vaccination? Yeah, we we give, so in these patients start, you got to ramp up the immune response really fast. In, in preclinical models, we've shown that rapid uh, vaccination really does have a, a, a difference. So we actually give a vaccine weekly uh, for the first three shots. And then we add anti-PD-1. We also delay anti-PD-1 because of some other preclinical data that we have that's shown that especially when you give it with some other agents, 
that it can be detrimental and make the response worse. So we give the PD-1 waiter, and given that we've tripled, doubled to tripled the response rate, we don't think we're hurting the response rate. I will say there was another vaccine that was just reported on in Nature Medicine by 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 Gridstone. There were there were 19 patients. They had no responses, and, and included six patients with lung cancer. So it's not, and that was with anti PD one and a vaccine and anti CTLA four. So the whole point is that there's lots of things we don't understand, but I think you've got to take all that knowledge and drive it into your trials. So your trials are there, and then you have to study the patients really closely. You can't put their samples in the freezer and not understand it because we have to figure out why patients respond and why patients don't respond. So we can make every patient a responder. That's the key. And we're only going to know that by studying them and getting patients to give us biopsies and to, to study that. Now, that's not going to help in the adjuvant setting, but um, when they don't have tumor, but but we need to do that. So we, we always think of Keytruda Abdivo for lung cancer patients. And uh, you, you're mentioning always PD-1 versus PD-L1. Hmm. So what is the difference? I'm, in Optivo op, op and, and Nivo, Nivo Wimab or, or, mm. or Keytruda, those are both anti-PD-1s. I apologize. I should have thought. Uh, whenever I said checkpoint blocker, <laughs> PD-1, um, mm. Optivo, uh, Keytruda, Nivo Wimab. Yeah. So and, let me jump in there. So Bernie, um, the reason that came up. So PD-1, like Bernie just said, Nivo Wimab and, and Optivo um, are... That was the same thing. Um, Dervalimab is a PDL1, and they're very similar. They are different, though. They're different targets, but the the concepts yeah. and their activities are very. Atezolizumab from Genentech, also a PDL1 inhibitor. Mm -hmm. And Mark, while I'm talking, I wanted to say one other thing, if that's okay. You heard Bernie mention adjuvant and neoadjuvant, and I just wanted everybody to know that those are treatment settings for early stage lung cancer patients. Neoadjuvant is when you give the therapy before your initial surgery for localized disease. And that's a really good learning place because you can give your drug. Then when they have their surgery, you can look at the tumor and you can assess, did it change? What's the, what's the uh, T cell infiltrate look like? Is it killing the tumor compared to the original <clears throat> biopsy? And then adjuvant again is an early stage. That's what we saw with the new uh, LENA trial results in ALK positive lung cancer where the TKI was given after they got their initial, compared to their, after their initial surgery, then it was used as an adjuvant because there was no measurable disease. So you can't measure the responses. So coming back to your question, Summer, depending on where you're doing your testing, but vaccines in general, I think like immunotherapies, trying to treat patients that have the smallest amount of disease is where they want to try to learn where your the vaccine is likely to have more benefit than someone who has lots and lots of both <clears throat> tumor. So I think you, we're going to see if we looked at all those trials, many of them are going to be in the early, earlier stages of not all, of course, but many of them will be in earlier stages. And again, too, thank you so much, um, both of you for clarifying. And again. Um, even though we're not typically candidates for immunotherapy because we don't typically respond or even though we have a high PDL, we have the low tumor burden. Um, but these still we're still candidates for, I just want to clarify that. Yeah. I'm sure that's going through people's minds, but we're still candidates obviously for vaccines. And I would think of it as your, your candidates for combination immunotherapy. You should be thinking about vaccines and what else it's being combined with. As Ken was talking at the beginning, you know, TKI inhibitors, and and that that's great because, but also you want to have something like a vaccine with some other maybe checkpoint inhibitor. Um, we are actually doing an arm where we're not going to give the PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor, but we're going to give the WAG-3 checkpoint inhibitor. That's the third checkpoint that's been um, uh, approved by the FDA only for melanoma. But we think that it's one marker that we've seen go up. So fortunately, we've got support from Insight to run that trial in head and neck. Mm -hmm. um, but those are the things that, that I think are really exciting. And and I, and and what you the people should know, right, is that this is a really exciting time. There are, these are breakthroughs that are coming. Our understanding of the biology has changed. We're, we're so far beyond where we were five years ago, let alone where we were twenty years ago. 
and and I'm just I'm so thrilled to still be able to be doing this now out 40 years and still be able to be 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 putting therapies into patients and seeing responses and understanding why somebody responds and then having good insights into why we think they're not responding so we can tweak them and get these other drugs to put them in combination because that's what it's going to take you don't treat hiv with one drug right there's triple uh, viral therapy or you got heart therapy uh, for most chemotherapies you give they give multiple different chemotherapies to give one immunotherapy is you know it's going to work in some people but it's not going to work in the majority of people yeah and, and summer if I, that bernie that was really well said so the ALK community, so what Summer just said, right, the clinical trials giving a PD-1 inhibitor to ALK positive lung cancer patients had really looked poor results, right? So we aren't included in immunotherapy trials, but if you come back to Bernie's analogy, you have the accelerator, you have the brake, and you have the ignition. So you can think, well, just giving the brake to ALK positive lung cancer patients didn't work. So one of the reasons why I was so excited to have Bernie talk tonight is you have to think about how do you incorporate all those three together, either in one therapy or, or in multiple therapies. So that's why I think we need to be thinking about it. Not that ALK is all that different than everybody else. We just need to have all the components and, and then people like Bernie and Vincent Lam and, you know, people in the ALK community are trying mm -hmm. to figure those things out. And and from our side, you know, we haven't done elk per se in terms of therapies, but but like I said, lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer. I think I saw something coming up about small cell lung cancer. But those are things, all things that you, we would like to do. They're just studies that you know you tr need to write NIH grants for. It takes time to do that. You need to try and find uh, support from the pharmaceutical industry to help you make the vaccine, which is where we are now. But those are things that, you know, as looking forward down the road are things we'd really be excited to do. And I know there's other people that are excited about moving their strategies into patients. But but the key is if you guys are, are if the community is supporting those sorts of things, they need to also support the monitoring. That's I just want to underscore that, because if you treat, you know, it's it's, it's like you're not treating patients with elk because with PD-1 because they don't respond to immunotherapy. It would be important to know whether or not the patients had immunity before they got the PD-1 inhibitor and whether or not that changed. And, and if you don't know those things, um, then you're just testing drugs blindly, right? And that's not where we want to be. Um, nice. No, this is so amazing. And for, uh, I'm sure many of you out there like me, that it is so far over my head, but your passion and excitement is um, definitely gives us all so much hope. And like you said um, in our pre-meeting about it developing, so, and just reiterated now that it's developing so rapidly, you had said like, yeah, I'll show my slides, but they might in six months, there might be even more information, right? They might be outdated that quickly. So. Uh Absolutely. And I would say um, not to advertise this, but more the references for this. I, I There's a talk on YouTube that I just gave recently as an NCI distinguished lecture January 11th, and that's on YouTube. And there's more references and kind of short stories about uh, the, the, the other scientifically re reviewed publications about dark matter on the UBVAC website uh, on the home. So there's a little bit there if you're interested more in understanding about that. The science, we've also put the posters. So the presentations that are not yet published that are under review or being submitted, those those sorts of things are on, on the website as well under presentations. Um, so what the whole thing is to try and help educate people. And, and there's a short YouTube video that I forgot to stick in there and given the time I didn't show it, but there's like a two or three minute video that, that explains us a little bit more about what we're trying to do with vaccines. So amazing. We are so grateful for you joining us on a Sunday afternoon for you right in the middle of your day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This was fabulous. Um, Mark, Ken, anything else? Um, I just want to, um, Ken, can you give us a little bit of a preview of next Sunday's Alp Talk? Real quick. Uh, uh, next Sunday, um, we're going to have an update on uh, all the exciting work the medical committee's doing. I guess tonight is dark matter. Next week's going to be white matter. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Fox. <laughs>
like like some of this kind of flew over my head a little bit, but <laughs> it's very exciting stuff. <laughs> so. Very. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's a, pre a pleasure to do this. And Ken, thank you for reaching out. And Summer, nice meeting you. And Mark, thank you for your time. Yes. Thank you all for listening. Else. And I may um, stalk you with some of the chat questions that we didn't get to. If that okay. <laughs> very good. I have those tendencies. Sorry. But then we can just clear up a couple of things. So thank <laughs> you so much. And we will see you all next week. Don't forget to check out our calendars again um, that Mark went over in the beginning. Um, get yourself out there connecting with some Alkies um, and have a great week. We'll see you all next Sunday, Dr. Fox. Thank you. And bye thank, bye. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. very thank much. You.